Amen. Well, we are going through a new series now called the Book of Acts, the Early Church. And we are now in Acts chapter 4, the Book of Acts chapter 4. If you recall last week, we talked about healing, right? How the brethren came over to this guy who had been lame all these years, and they said, gold coins we don't have, because they were asking, he was asking them for money. And they said, get up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's who heals us, it's Jesus, right? It's not, it's not any of us, but God works through us to heal others. So then, at that moment, Peter and uh, the saints delivered a sermon to all the people that were watching what had just happened, okay? And it was at the gate called the Beautiful Gate. And wow, 2,000 more people got saved that day. So now the church is up to 5,000 people in the early Roman Empire. Uh, and it says this in Acts chapter 4. While they were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So, they are preaching to this uh, crowd who's in Jerusalem at this time for the festival. If you recall, it was a festival time, the festival of Pentecost, I believe. And they were preaching to them, and then the uh, Pharisees, which were like the religious leaders of Israel, saw them doing this. They saw Peter, they saw John, they saw the disciples teaching about Jesus. And they said, hold on a second, you can't do that. You know? If you recall, the Jews rejected Jesus, right? The Jews did not believe Jesus was really their Messiah. So what they did was they arrested them. <clears throat> and it says they were annoyed. And they were teaching the people and proclaiming that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So they seized them, so they, they arrested Peter and James and John and all of them. Peter and John were arrested and took them into custody until the next day, since it was already evening. So all they're doing is preaching about Jesus in the city square by the temple, and they get arrested. And they get thrown in jail for this. That's got to be stressful, you know? All you're trying to do is preach the word, and then pretty soon you're in jail. That's stressful. Does anyone in here ever come to jail? You don't have to raise your hands for that one. But, uh, oh boy, yep, yeah, see? It's not fun, is it? That's really not fun. <clears throat> so they're in jail for preaching the word of God. That's a better reason to be in jail than for like something not good, right? Like drinking or drugs or something. So that they're in jail for a good reason. <clears throat> and it says, But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So starting with the 12 disciples, remember there were 3,000 that got saved on Pentecost, Right? Now another 2,000 men have gotten saved. So you got 5,000 men. Okay? That's not including women and children, though. So it's probably more like about 10,000 to 12,000. So it's growing fast, right? The church is taking off, isn't it? And that's, that's 2,000 years ago. Today, even in Owasso, you got a church in every corner, right? That's because Jesus is really real. That's why. And I'm not saying every church is going to be perfect or biblical. Some of them are not. So you've got to watch out for that. But there are a lot of good churches, right? Good little churches, good places to worship God. And I love that. And it's all started here in the book of Acts. The book of Acts in the Bible is in the New Testament. It's all about the growth of the early church. Right after Jesus, here's the growth of the early church. Then it says, the next day, so they've now been in jail overnight, the next day their rulers, the elders, and the scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. So these are all like the leaders, the religious leaders of Israel, of Jerusalem. They're all gathered there. And they're, they're stressed out about this Jesus guy that everyone keeps talking about. Because they didn't like Jesus. They disagreed with Jesus because Jesus was saying, look, I'm the way of salvation. And they didn't like that. 
So they're gathered together, they're like, you know, we crucified Jesus, and people are still talking about him. Now what do we do? So, they go to Peter and John, and they say to them, by what power or in what name have you done this? So they're asking about the, the lame guy that was healed, right? Said, how did you do this? How did you get this guy healed? What power did you use? Are you guys magicians? Are you guys, what, what are you guys, demons? Like, how did you heal them? And then it says, Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Ah, so the Holy Spirit's about to speak through him. Okay? That's what happens when I preach, is the Holy Spirit speaks through me. That's what happens when you give someone a good word from the Lord, the Holy Spirit is speaking through you. Okay? That's, that's for real. So Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says to the rulers, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. It's because of Jesus. So you got Peter and James, and I think also standing before this group is the, is the lame guy who was healed. He's probably standing there like grinning, you know. My feet work again, he's all happy, he's dancing around. And you got James and John like, it was Jesus who did this. It was Jesus. It wasn't us. It wasn't because we're so smart or something. It's because Jesus is still at work in the world. And then Peter says to them, This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. Do you guys know what a cornerstone is? Have you guys ever heard of a cornerstone? Yeah, okay, some of you have heard about that. It's the most important stone. It's the most important stone, Scott. It's the most important stone in any building. And every other stone is resting on this cornerstone, okay? Every other stone is resting right on the cornerstone. And it's very, very important. So they're saying Jesus is the cornerstone that was rejected by the Jewish leaders. And he has become, in, in fact, the cornerstone for all of our faith. And it says in verse 12, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. So they're saying there is no other name, there is no other religion, there is no other savior, it's not Muhammad, it's not Gandhi, it's not Zoroaster, it's not Buddha, it's not Hinduism, it's not um, New Age beliefs, it's not Wicca, it's not witchcraft, it's not any of these false beliefs, it's not, it's not any of that. So, and it's very clear. It says there is salvation in no one else but Jesus. No one else but Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. So you'll hear some false teachers in our world say, Oh, Jesus is just one way to God, right? You've probably heard that before. Jesus is just one of many ways to God. That's false. That's not true. Jesus is the only way to God. That's the way it is. That is the way it is. There's no other way. None. No other religion. No other path. No other philosophy. Only Jesus. Right here it says so. It says, When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they, they had been with Jesus. So they realized, okay, we remember Peter and John from seeing them with Jesus. Okay? So they saw Jesus working throughout Jerusalem, throughout the countryside, throughout Galilee, throughout Capernaum. And they saw Jane or John and Peter with him. So they knew, okay, these guys are legit followers of Jesus. We saw them with Jesus. Okay? And since they saw the man who had been healed, 
standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So, you've got, you've got Peter and John standing there saying, Jesus did this, and you guys crucified him, and Jesus is the way. Then you've got the lame guy standing here, his legs work good. Everyone knows they've seen this guy in front of the temple for 30 years, okay? They've seen him everywhere, and he's always been lame. So all these religious leaders, normally they would say, oh, you're wrong because of this, this, and that. They can't say anything. Because they're seeing the healed guy, they're seeing uh, Peter and, and John, and they, they, they got nothing to say. It's over. <laughs> so then it says, after they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, that's the, the leader's council, they confirmed among themselves, saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, that we cannot deny it. But so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered them. So the Sanhedrin comes together and says, All right, you obviously did, you know, heal this man from Jesus, but you need to stop talking about Jesus. Stop it. Stop. Stop talking about Jesus. And what would, what would you say if someone told you that? I'd say, uh, No, I'm going to keep talking about Jesus. And that's what Peter and John say. They say, Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you, Rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't stop. I can't stop. You know, I've had many friends, many friends, who used to read my writing. I, I, I used to blog quite a bit, write quite a bit. And a lot of them started complaining after I got saved. They said, all you do is talk about Jesus. And I said, yup. Yes, what, where's the problem in this? That he, all I do is talk about Jesus because he's everything. So it says, After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. So he'd been lame for 40 years. Since birth, I assume, he'd been lame. So they threatened them more and said, Hey, don't talk about Jesus. Stop it. Or we'll beat you up or something. You're in big trouble, pal. All right, now get out of here. So they threaten them and tell them to go. So, the, normally they want to punish them by like having them whipped or something, but they can't find anything that they did wrong. So they just let them go. So they say, hey, stop talking about Jesus. So after they released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, So, they preach the word in front of the people. The man gets saved. They preach the word in front of the Sanhedrin, the leader's council. And now they go back together with the believers and they pray to God. Okay? So they're praying for help because they're a little worried, you know. Are, is the Sanhedrin, are the Pharisees going to try to stop us from preaching about Jesus? But what do you do when you're worried about anything? You pray. You pray. It's the first thing you should do when you're stressed, when you're worried, when you're having a struggle. Get down on your knees and pray. Sit down and pray on the floor. Whatever works, pray, pray, pray. And they, they pray. They said, Master, you are the one who made heaven, the earth and the sea and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit by the mouth of our father David, your servant, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats, and grant that your servants may speak your word with boldness, while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and begin to speak the word of God boldly. Hallelujah. So they pray to God and they say, Lord, help us in this situation. The Sanhedrin is, is threatening us. They don't want us to, to preach your word. And they talk about everything that's happened to God, and they just pour out their hearts to God, and God, God shakes the place that they're in. It literally shakes. Have you ever had this experience when you're praying, and the room will shake? Have you ever had that? It's, it's rare. I, I, I've had that happen once when I got born again. The room shook. That's the power of God coming into that place. So finally it says, and it talks about the early church, it says, Now the entire group of those who believed were of one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. With great power the apostles were given testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them. For there was not a needy person among them, because all those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as any had need. So the early church was taking all their money, all their wealth, all their possessions, selling it all, and giving money to the poor. Isn't that interesting? They are giving money to the poor. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, so praise the Lord, and the proceeds were going to those in need. And we should do the same thing today. We should do the same thing today. We should give of our money and our wealth and our possessions to those in need. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So it says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, Sold the field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he took all this land he owned, he sold it all, and he laid the money at the apostles' feet. Isn't that beautiful? Praise God. So that is Acts chapter 4. That is our journey through the book of Acts. We'll continue next week.